What does it really mean to be on the race from the point of view of a contestant? After casting is finished, the queens might have anywhere between 6 to 8 weeks to prepare for the show. This includes runway looks, which is easily the most expensive part of the process. We love stunning looks, but we easily forget the cost behind it. Favors will be asked, credit cards will be maxed out, some might even ask for a small loan because the expense can go anywhere from five to fifty thousand dollars especially if you can sew all in the name of an opportunity because being on drag race can really change their lives forever most queens will get to leave their day job and finally earn a living performing on stage and what an earning a good run on Drag Race can easily skyrocket your annual income to anywhere between $1 to $3 million if you play your cards well and work hard enough. It's the opportunity of a lifetime, but it comes with a risk. Some of these queens will finish the race and find themselves despised by the general public. The career they worked so hard to build will crumble under social media pressure and on top of that they'll be in debt because of the money they invested in the first place. That's the downside of signing away your likeness. The producers have the legal right to portray the queens however they want to. They can dramatize situations and take them to the extreme, or even cut and paste audiovisual material to create situations that never even happened. They can twist people's words, take them out of context, and make you look like somebody else entirely, even someone unrecognizable. That's because on reality TV, you cease to be you, and your likeness is used instead to craft a new character. And forget about telling what really happened once you leave the race. The contract leaked and speaking out will cost you two million dollars if the producers decide to push charges. Granted, this contract was from season 8. But I gotta ask you a question. Do you think that amount of money went up or down after the show moved to a much bigger network like VH1, gaining even more visibility than ever before? My best guess is that it went up, way up, probably around 5 millions, but that's just my opinion. So you understand now, being on Drag Race is a huge gamble, and that alone puts a ton of pressure on the contestants. If that wasn't enough, filming hours on set are devastating. Queens who spoke out said that the entire season is filmed in less than a month. Filming can last anywhere between 12 to 15 hours a day and that's just the tip of the iceberg because the fact that they're not filming doesn't mean they're not working. Remember Monique? Girl, why didn't you know your words? Because I stayed up working on that damn costume. And let's not forget that this is reality TV. The producers will do their best to push their storylines and it's common practice to align the judging panel in a way that encourages the stories that they want to tell. In addition, there's a lot happening behind the scenes that we don't see. What do you think these people's job is? Think about it. And all of that serves one purpose and one purpose only. Creating a show that entertains the viewer. And if some hacks have to be broken, so be it. In the real world, there are no such things as villains, victims, heroes, narrators or underdogs. There are only 12 people who signed away their likeness in an effort to build a better future for themselves. They invested huge amounts of money, they are overworked, underslept, possibly misadvised and under an immense amount of pressure. And when the pressure reaches the breaking point, some of them are bound to crumble.
Welcome to the chop. Before we begin, I have to address the fact that we were wrong about Brita's confessional. Last episode, we assumed that the editors put words in her mouth when it's clear now that she said what she said. I was convinced when I saw this clip of her mouthing every word. Since you've taken naps while all of us are working hard, she literally just put balls on a corset. And of course, there's Untucked, but we're going to talk about that later. I want to take advantage of this mistake to explain to you why it happened in the first place. When I find myself in doubt about what's really happening, I'll always give the queens, any queen, the benefit of the doubt. The editors have a long and colorful history of misconstruing what's really happening, and I'd rather have to come here admitting fault time after time than to risk putting additional weight on people who are under contract not to speak. Mistakes will be made, and there's no way to avoid that. But rest assured, we are going to own them. Also, recently I've been told that I'm only allowed to talk bad about Brita because of some controversial statements that she made on social media. Curiously, last week I was told the same about Aiden because of her controversial statements on social media. I have no interest in social media drama. The chop is about Drag Race, the editing of the show and what's going on behind the scenes. And I won't compromise my objectivity because of the way people decided to make a fool of themselves on social media. And with that said, let's move on. This episode, some queens crumbled under pressure and the editors took full advantage of that. I have a lot of things to show you about Aiden, Brita, Gigi and Wido, but before we get into that, we absolutely need to put things into perspective. When I look around, I see people divided between taking Brita's side or Aiden's side, as if those are the only possible choices that we have. But I think there is a third one. Both of them have a valid point and both of them are at fault on some level. It's going to be a lot to unpack, so bear with me. Let's start with Aiden. I think it's pretty clear that Aiden came in the race with some personal baggage. She was pretty shy about being a bedroom queen, to the point of trying to avoid the issue altogether. As I said before, there's nothing wrong with being a bedroom queen. Everyone needs to start somewhere and we don't judge people on the amount of experience they have or the amount of money they can spend on their drag. What matters is raw talent, the effort they put in their work and their growth over time. But you cannot grow as an entertainer without some honest feedback. Sometimes it's hard to acknowledge one's own faults and honest feedback is where the growth really begins. It's the same in every aspect of life, it's just life. I think the producers took note of all that and they took full advantage of Aiden's lack of experience to craft their storylines. Since the very beginning, the judging panel completely avoided giving Aiden any form of realistic and honest feedback. Instead, they constantly fed him this illusion that his drag is perfect just the way it is, that there is something special about him and that he is different in a way that sets him apart from the rest. And I gotta ask you, who doesn't like to hear that? From a loved one, a friend, or even your boss at work. Who doesn't like to hear someone say that you are unique, that there's something special about you? And Aiden completely bought into that and started developing an attitude that played right in the producer's end. The one thing that they keep telling me is I do have that uniqueness about me. These girls thought that I probably should have been in the bottom two for the ball challenge, but I wasn't. And Penny will be played by Aiden. Okay. Are you happy with it? Um, I guess I'm gonna have to be, aren't I? The problem is, everyone took notice of that one wig. You can buy wigs on the cheap and make them look more than acceptable but you have to put in the time and effort in doing so. And what about that corset with balls hot glued on it? Everyone took notice, especially the other contestants who got read to filth for much less. Even Aiden himself took notice outside of the race. 
when she posted this picture on Instagram, acknowledging the lack of effort in the original dress and reimagining it in a much more flattering way. That's the growth I'm talking about. Acknowledging your shortcomings, learning from them and elevating your art. That's what I want to see, not this delusion of minimalistic style fueled by a judging panel who couldn't care less about Aiden's personal and professional growth. They have been biased and they have been giving Aiden special treatment. But I bet they didn't do it to build up her confidence, I can tell you that much. Their job is to make a show, and that's their priority. When a lackluster performance gets praised, while decent ones get read to filth, and that happens over and over, it puts an extra layer of pressure on the contestants, especially on those with well-established careers who need to live up to their names. It also frustrates them, as it puts them in the frame of mind that no matter how hard they try, it will never be enough, while other people will be praised no matter what. And that is a recipe for disaster, a carefully crafted recipe for disaster. Then we get to Brita. There is no excuse for Brita's outburst of anger in Untucked. I understand the reason behind it. The pressure of being on the race is immense, and the frustration that comes from a biased panel of judges surely doesn't make things any easier, but there is still no excuse. Part of a professional life in any field is being able to see people skating by and learning to live with it. Meritocracy is a good concept in theory, but it's seldom applied in real life. There's no way to avoid that. But part of being a professional is seeing people getting special treatment and being able to swallow. And to swallow with a smile. The sooner you learn it, the better. And I expected a person of Brita's age and experience to have learned this lesson long ago. But she didn't, and that too played right into the producer's end. And here's the point that I want to make. On one hand, there's Brita. She has a point because the judging panel really was biased. But she's also at fault because she was supposed to behave like a professional and not take her frustration out on Aiden. On the other hand, there's Aiden. She also has a point because if the show wants to reward her for doing the bare minimum, that's her business and her business only. She's under contract to make a show, not to justify the producer's choices. But she is also at fault, because she failed to acknowledge that there are such things like basic social norms. She was helped by Jen with her concept. Everybody saw that. She's under no obligation to return the favor, and if she wanted to play the race on her own, she had the freedom to do so. But going to sleep in front of everybody else, while they're working hard and probably thinking that they're going to be judged unfairly no matter what, it just sends the wrong message, because it feels like mocking. You don't sleep in front of your colleagues while they are struggling to finish their work, as much as you don't stuff your mouth in front of someone struggling to keep on with his diet. You just don't do things like that. It's not a crime, but it's not appropriate. It's a basic form of respect and courtesy. And right on top of both of them, there are the producers, pulling the strings behind the scenes to make as much reality TV gold as possible. I think there are no sides to be taken here, only two people who got pushed around to behave exactly as they were supposed to. And now it's our turn, the viewers, to be pushed around into buying these narratives of villains and victims. The editing during this episode was way, way too much. It pulled me out of the experience multiple times and that's the opposite of what I expect when I'm trying to suspend my disbelief and be entertained. I think this could easily be the worst episode of the season. Brita's villain edit is in full force and so is Aiden's victim edit. Rita has a ton of negative confessionals, but we're gonna talk about those during the speculations. She's constantly bitch-facing Aiden, and the shady noises follow her like a shadow. I just hear Rockham's crying and how badly she wanted this, while other people did the bare minimum and skated by again. I didn't just sit back and think like, all right, I'm, I'm done, guys. Like, who gives a No. 
so that you take naps while all of us are working hard. Aiden, like, you know Mae West, right? Um, probably not like you guys, oh. but yeah. Boo! Boo! Got any good news for me? Oh, uh, sorry. <sighs> um, and then Britta, it's comma. R A S. Comma. Um, my mom. You look like a Polynesian queen. It's really gorgeous. <laughs> the Hedit even went as far as making fun of Brita's speech. I'm no orthodontist, but it looks to me like Brita's teeth are not real. And I know for a fact that when you have fake teeth, if they're not done absolutely perfectly, people tend to spit when they speak. It's just a mechanical thing and there is no way to avoid it. I find that making fun of it was really in poor taste. But hey, she's a villain, right? We can unload on her as much as we want. Brita has a temper and she still has a lot to learn about what it means to be a professional, but that's not a valid excuse to dehumanize her like that. Aiden is stripped away of any agency to become a victim and everybody else must look like they're ganging up on her. While other people did the bare minimum and skated by again. I see them seeing something in Aiden. They're like, you're so special. How can they see something in, in her like that? And because I look polished, I just don't have it. How do you not know who Mae West is? Call my lawyer. You cannot constantly every challenge say, well, I'm not from a big city like the other girls. I'm not from a big city. You have to at some point step up to the plate because this is not RuPaul's excuse race. In the beginning of the episode, while she speaks, everyone else is shown bitch facing with the usual shady noise playing in the background. Like, they liked the look. I read Betty Page esque look. And I just need to. Even honest critiques and opinions are framed to look like everyone is bullying her. I really honestly did think that you were probably in the bottom. Just solely based off like the look. And you cannot afford to make excuses for yourself to not do the best or better than you know you can do. And even Gigi, the hero of the season, is sacrificed on the altar of Aiden's victim edit. I wanted a ver I wanted a ver I wanted a ver Aiden doesn't really strike me as somebody who's going to stand out. Stand out. Stand out. When we were deciding, we were like, I think she could do good as, like, a ghost. I don't see why we can't all work something out. <laughs> Boo! Why don't you come up and IV me sometime? In the end of the episode, for the first time in Drag Race history, we have five tops and five bottoms. What a coincidence, right? We all know that Brita and Aiden did good in the challenge. Not great, but good for sure. And both of them should have been just safe. But by dividing them this way, it puts an extra layer of confidence on Aiden for being on top and of frustration on Brita for being in the bottom, facilitating even more what we eventually saw happening in Untucked. You might say, shit really went down. And I would agree. That's exactly what it looks like. And that explains why the editors pushed this narrative of victims and villains so hard during the last episodes, despite the fact that there was almost nothing there. It is called laying down the foundations. Its purpose is to prepare you for what's coming and enhance your emotional reaction once shit really goes down. They are doing the same with Widow. Widow too was bothered by the situation, and you can see it when she made this comment. But I see a fire in her, and I feel like she might be able you to see start a candle. Oh! Other than that, her villain edit feels completely unjustified to me. During the whole episode, she's constantly shown bitch facing everyone, with the usual shady noise behind it. Nikki, how are you feeling about your critiques? I feel happy because who did Widow want to play? Um, mother. I don't think they're gonna sabotage a bitch. 
But you never know. Then Mimi Dearest. Anything with their role. All right. Then we try to accommodate everyone. We got work to do, ladies. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> We cannot prove that all of those shots are fake, but we found two that surely look particularly magical to me. In this clip, Nikki is talking and Widow is bitch facing, of course, but take a look at her harm. Nikki, how are you feeling about your critiques? I feel happy because being praised for what I've created boosts my ego. Magical, isn't it? After Rue made her point about Widow's role, which was pretty funny by the way, Gigi is saying they got work to do, and immediately Weedo is shown bitch-facing again. But if you look closely at the script in her hands, you can see that in the first shot she's picking it up, while immediately afterward she's putting it down. And I'm going to slow down this clip for you so that you can exactly see what's happening. Okay. <laughs> oh well. We got work to do, lady. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh well. We got work to do, lady. Yep. Yeah. At some point, she even traveled in time to insult Gigi and Nikki. They're sweet spirits. I don't think they're gonna sabotage a bitch. But you never know, the sweet ones are the ones you gotta look out for. I will be baby dearest. So Her will baby. be <laughs> the family. These bitches. Didn't we hear we don't talk with that tone of voice before? Oh yes, in episode one. Miss Jackie and Miss Britta, you two hoes, shut up and let me do my job. Now take a look at these three shots. The producers might force the queens to wear the same clothes for every confessional, but I bet they won't go as far as ironing them in the same way each time. Take a look at the folds in the neck of Widow's shirt. Magical, isn't it? So it looks to me like the confessional where she appeared to insult Nikki and Gigi actually came from episode 1. And if you look closely, you can notice that the filtering is different too. The first confessional on the left is much darker than the other two. I don't understand why they are pushing so hard on Widow's villain edit but it might have something to do with what we said in episode 1, when she was edited to bitch face Gigi for the first time. It's the second time I see this narrative being pushed, as if the editors are trying to plant the seeds for something that's going to happen, and probably make Widow look even worse in the process. So keep an eye on her for the next episodes. And now, it's award season. Bullshit. 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 That's bullshit. 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 That's bullshit. A joke. Every fucking time. I was being realistic. Was, realistic was, was bullshit. A... Girl, bullshit. You are a fucking liar. This week's Fifi Award goes to RuPaul for saying this. You've been calling me out a lot on not showing my quirky side. You did a good job. It uh, really gets down to minor details at this point. Which point in the competition are we at? Two queens went home. Two. There are ten others on stage. Are we really at that point in the competition? I mean, come on. I get it. They have a script. They have to follow it. Nikki has to go home. But come on, at least put on the effort to give her a credible critique. Incredible. And now, let's move on to the chart and make some speculations. We do speculations every week, either on the chop or on livestream. For the next couple of weeks, probably three, we'll only do speculations on stream. I really rushed to get this episode out and I need to take a pause for the next couple of weeks. Stream will be back on Sunday or Monday, depending on how much time I have to put the material together. I'll keep you advised in the community tab of the channel, so keep your notification on if that's your thing. If you don't want any possible spoilers, this is the moment where you should stop the video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Last week we speculated that either Nikki or Aiden would go home. The reason behind it is that Nikki's drag was simply too similar to Gigi and Gigi as a hero headed. As we said before, being challenged is part of a hero headed. 
but direct comparisons are not, especially if they run the risk to outshine the hero. Aiden was nominated because of its overall lackluster performance. We've seen the panel of judges doing triple somersault episode after episode in a desperate effort to justify your presence in the show and we speculated that they couldn't do that for much longer. At the end of the episode, Aiden was on top and Nikki went home, but not before having her fair share of negative confessionals. Speaking of negative confessionals, Brita towers all the other queens for the amount of negative confessionals. She is the villain of the season and this episode is all about her. Jackie is the voice of reason for the episode. She has only positive confessionals and the tiny amount of negative confessional that you see is just a remark on Aiden framed in a negative way. As we said before, those remarks serve the purpose of fortifying Aiden's victim headed and we should not consider them when we make speculation about who is going home or how far the queens are going to go in the competition. Aiden is the opposite of Brita. She has zero negative confessionals exactly as we would expect from a victim headed. Contrary to what happened to Jackie's negative confessionals, Aiden has a lot of confessionals that look like negative remarks but are framed in a positive way. Widow has her fair share of negative confessionals. We already talked about Widow and what her headed looked like during the entire episode and what we see here is just further proof that she is the second villain of the season. The amount of negative confessionals that she has are in no way connected to Aiden's victim headed, so we should consider them when we try to understand how far Widow will go in the competition. ID had only positive confessionals this episode, despite the fact that she lip synced for her life, and I would consider this as further proof that the editors have a longer run in mind for Heidi. If they really wanted to question her position in the competition right here and right now, we would probably have seen some negative confessionals. Jada has a lot of negative confessionals compared to the usual. And I think that is because of what happened during Untucked. From my point of view, Jada looked like the only one who honestly tried to give Aiden any form of realistic feedback and she should have probably kept her mouth shut because the headed made her look like she was ganging up with the other girls. I still believe she is a front runner for the season but this episode is taking a dent into her reputation for this season. And now the most curious case of all. Look at Jen, Gigi and Crystal. They have zero amount of positive or negative confessionals. Now confessionals are those moments in which we get to build an intimate relationship with the contestants and it's curious to see that Jen, Gigi and Crystal have almost none as if the producers wanted to keep our intimate relationship with these three characters separate from what's going on during the episode. So who is going on next episode? From my perspective, I see only two possible scenarios. Brita and Aiden said it are intertwined with each other. Brita is the villain and Aiden is the victim. The two storylines are bound together and they will continue to go on together. They will either go home one after the other, like what happened with Reja O'Hara and Plastique last season or they will both reach the top together, much like what happened with Silky Ganache and Evie Oddly last season. But which one of the two options is more likely? If one of them has to go home, I see no better opportunity than the Snatch Game episode. And if one of them does go home, then expect the other one to already go home the episode after, because the end of one storyline means the end of the complementary storyline that accompanies it. I also can see the editors milking this situation for as much as possible, because both of them have proven to be reality TV gold. 
But if none of them is going home, then who is going home next episode? Contrary to what we did until now, we will have to do this prediction by exclusion. Jen, Gigi and Crystal have all well-defined storylines in this season. Jen is the narrator, and as we know, the narrator never reaches the top and always stops around very close to the top. Gigi is the hero of the season and she will surely reach the top three. Crystal is the silent assassin of the season, but at this point we haven't seen her shine so far, so it will either happen this episode or we were wrong and she is being candy hoed. I don't think Crystal has any chance to go home this episode based on what I've seen so far, but you never know, so if we see her bomb the snatch game, then it's very probable that she was candy hoed and she is going home. Jada is the second front runner of the season. There is no chance that they're sending her home. But the amount of negative confessionals are already casting a shadow on her possibility to win the competition. ID is the underdog slash redemption edit for this season. During this episode she only had positive confessionals despite the fact that she lip synced for her life. I don't think that Heidi has any chance to go home next episode. She still has to prove herself and win a challenge. After that it will be another story. Widow is the second villain of the season and based on the fact that the editors have been laying down the foundation for our villain edit during the whole episode, I don't think there is any chance that she's going on next episode either. Jackie doesn't have a defined storyline. During the episode she had a moment in the beginning and at the end of the episode that seemed to bring her headed to a full circle. For this reason I think there might be a chance that she gets eliminated next episode. I do not see how it could be possible considering her acting abilities, but at this point we are simply doing this by exclusion. So our final prediction is that Brita and Aiden will either reach the top together or go down together. And if they go down, they will start going down by next episode. If that doesn't happen, we should keep an eye on Crystal and Jackie. And that's all for this episode. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Why don't you come up and RV me sometime? Oh. Just why don't you come on up and fuck me in the ass sometime? <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs>